you don't need to retain an actual template of the biometric, but the information that is retained is biometrically encrypted, meaning it has the strength of the biometric in it, but it can only be decrypted when that biometric is presented. So you get all the benefits, the strength, the positive identification, the security of a biometric, but you also get the privacy protective features of the biometric encryption such that only the individual who possesses the biometric can actually decrypt, if you will, the biometric. In effect, the biometric encryption functions as a, as a private key, in effect. And so you get the best of both. You get the positive sum model of biometrics and privacy rolled into one technology. Very, very interesting. Um, in the interviews that we've had uh, at the EBF in the last few months, uh, two people come to mind as being relevant. One is, of course, Peter Hustings, who has been very critical uh, of some aspects of how biometric technologies have been rolled out. And then the other is Ilka Leitinen, so as the executive director of Frontex, and uh, in his perspective, uh, biometrics are the future. Uh, so uh, to what extent is this technology going to, in a sense, revolutionize that debate and keep both sides happy? Well, and I think that's the key, Johnny, is how do you keep both sides happy? And that's why I keep uh, talking about this new term, transformative technology that I've developed, which is a positive sum paradigm, as opposed to the traditional zero sum approach to biometrics and, and many forms of of technology surveillance. A zero sum means you can have more of one thing, but always at the expense of privacy. So the traditional approach to biometrics has been biometrics at the expense of privacy. So it's not surprising that Peter Hustings would object to many forms of biometrics, especially one to many comparisons, because they often forfeit privacy in order to have the strength of the biometric. The beauty of this technology of biometric encryption is it will address Peter Husting's concerns as well as uh, not stand in the way of the functionality of the strength of the biometric in terms of the security and authentication and positive identification features that it can deliver. But it can do that in a way that is very privacy protective so that the biometric will only be used for the purpose for which it was intended. and. Peter Hustings would have no problem with that because the issue is not, I think Mr. Hustings would also agree that one-to-one -one comparisons generally are um, not applauded, if you will, but, but considered acceptable by the, by the data protection community because the individual, the user, has greater control over the uses of that biometric and it can only be made available through um, the presence of the live biometric in effect. The beauty of biometric encryption is it serves a similar function. It wraps up the uses, it prevents secondary use of the biometric absent the presence of the individual's biometric and enables the individual to facilitate the decryption of the biometrically encrypted key and only his or her biometric can do that. So it preserves the strength uh, from a privacy perspective of a one-to-one -one comparison, but in a scenario that will also allow one-to-many. Now, this is gonna be on YouTube, uh, so there may be an audience who aren't familiar with some of the uh, terminology. Can you just briefly say what one-to-one -one is? Of course. One-to-one -one is, let's say I go to the border for a border crossing, and I present my, uh, the biometric that appears in my passport. So my biometric, a sample of my biometric, a bi the biometric template would appear on th that identity document, a passport, for example. The person at the border crossing wants to authenticate that that passport and the biometric contained therein belongs to me, the individual who's presenting myself as being um, as, as, as possessing that uh, passport. So what would happen is my live biometric, let's say my finger, would be put on a live scan and that would be compared electronically to the biometric residing in my passport. So one to one comparison. My fingers compared to the biometric on the passport, one to one comparison. There's a positive match, which means this is in fact my passport that's my biometric, I'm good. It's a positive match I can go through. Contrast that to a one-to-many comparison 
where my live fingerprint is not compared to the fingerprint template on the passport, but compared to a database of fingerprints that reside centrally somewhere in a database. So it's not to the identity document right there, but to, a, to many templates, and my fingerprint is being compared to one to many templates. Mm. And, and the beauty, one other thing, if I may add, ISO is now actually looking at developing an ISO standard for BE biometric encryption as well. So this is wonderful that it's being given uh, so much prominence now. Well, that, I was actually exactly about to ask you, what are the next steps? How long before this is rolled out and, and publicly in use? I'm delighted to say that in the last year we have made such progress in this area. So there are several companies, commercial organizations, that are now developing algorithms for BE. So Philips out of the Netherlands uh, was, was the first one out of the gate and they have a viable biometric encryption uh, template right now and they're making it available commercially per se. A company, an, an Israeli company out of um, Jerusalem, has applied BE for the first time to voice authentication. So not only is it now available for fingerprint and face, but now it's also available for voice authentication. We're delighted that Per Se has worked with uh, Philips and they're now making it applicable to voice. We're also looking at it here in the context of finger and face in Canada. So I'm very optimistic that you will have some commercial applications. You already have several commercial applications, but that this will become far more widespread in the next year. And as you know, there's a workshop on BE that you're offering later in June, which we're absolutely delighted about. This is the first time that I'm aware of. And so I, I think in the next year, you will see much more widespread, certainly understanding and acceptance of BE, which will hopefully lead to further commercialization. I've also been invited to give a keynote speech on BE to IEEE this year, which as you know is, is the International Association, the standards body for engineers, and I'm absolutely delighted as a non-engineer to have been invited to speak at uh, their forum in, in September. So I think I'll give it another year and I think you will see many commercially app commercial applications coming um, quite prevalent. Excellent. Well, Dr. Kabukin, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to this interview and uh, we, we will follow your, your progress. And also I note that um, Fred Carter and Alex uh, Sonayo, Stoyanov. 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 <laughs> that's my Irish pronunciation of his name, <laughs> will be speaking at the, uh, the Biometric Encryption Seminar on the 24th of June in Amsterdam. So thank you very much again.